Peace, family. It's your brother, Mark Lamont Hill. You're watching the Mark Lamont Hill official YouTube channel. Welcome to Night School. If this is your first time here, Night School is a Monday to Friday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 Pacific time, global classroom, right? This is not a podcast. This is not a TV show. This is a global classroom where I break down some of the most important ideas, some of the biggest news items, some of the strongest currents going on in our culture. But I don't just read the news. We break stuff down on a whole different level. And tonight in night school, we are joined by, I guess you could call him a guest lecturer. He is one of the most important, one of the most visible, one of the most prominent voices uh, on all of social media and all of new media or whatever you want to call it streamer youtube all the places twitchy of course is, is home home he's there and this brother is is a guy who i like he's somebody who i admire he's somebody who i'm still learning from in terms of how to navigate this space with integrity and critical acuity holding on to strong left-wing progressive radical values even uh while still getting the word out man this dude is so dope I got to bring him. I had to bring him on, man. And I asked him if he would come on. I'm going to say one more thing before I bring him on. In this business of media, lots of people will be like, yeah, I'll do your show. Oh, yeah, I'll come on. Yeah, I got you. I got you. It's like Hollywood talk. And you never hear from him again unless they need something. But this brother came through. He said he was going to do it. He kept his word. He always keeps his word. Uh, and that's why he's here with me. Hasanabi, my brother. Good to see you, man. I, I honestly thought you were going to bring up someone else. When you when you were saying such nice things, I was like, oh, damn, is there like another guest going on? What the hell? <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't deserve such kind of words. I'll be honest with you. That's, that's wild. Um, but no, I, I do admire you quite a bit, Mark. So I'm excited to be on your show on the lecture as a guest lecturer. That's it, man. Well, it's it's mutual for sure, man. I, I'm, I'm happy to have you here um, because... First of all, for those that don't know, and I feel like a lot of people in this in this live experience right now are, are, are your people, but sort of when people say you are a prominent streamer, you know, and is that the is the first one is that the title you like for yourself? Yeah. Uh, also, can you hear me right now? Yeah. Okay. Good. I just switched up the, my microphone because there's um, I I have my chat still running from when I was streaming earlier, and they were like, "Oh, what a dummy! He used the wrong microphone." Um, but uh, what was your what was your question again? You said, uh, is it correct to call me a streamer? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I say I'm a, I, I say I'm a political commentator. I'm a Twitch streamer. It just depends. Like if I'm, it depends on who I'm talking to. Basically, like uh, I think in in like in mainstream media, when people ask me like what I do or how unique it is, I usually will say like it's not really that unique. I feel like I'm more of a, I, I'm I'm a bit of a Rush Limbaugh type, but also not deeply addicted to painkillers and not like a genuine can i curse on here you can curse all the fuck you want. okay i was gonna say like a white supremacist piece of shit like not like that so um you know i think he also was a broadcasting monster i guess he was a monster for different reasons too but like uh you know he would just do this stream of consciousness style uh uh non-stop commentary for hours and hours so that's that's basically what I uh, do as well. You're like destiny, but you know things. Oh God, I don't want to be even. I I am not like destiny. No, Rush Limbaugh is one guy. Okay, but definitely not like destiny. But yes, I do know things. You know a lot of things, and and, and I don't disrespect destiny. Destiny knows a lot of things too. He, he's he he talks about doing the cramming and doing the Wikipedia thing and crashing on knowledge. I've talked to Norm Finkelstein twice in the last few weeks and it i mean he really cooks his grits man when you say destiny around him he just norm finkelstein just loses his shit norm is like the most slow talking measured person but when you say destiny he goes i just can't take that thing destiny and then he just like goes, i love norm because in many respects i will say this much i think norm finkelstein i you might have your disagreements with him Uh, i certainly do on on you know more of his like uh new commentary but when it comes to gaza when it comes to uh being a chronicler of the palestinian plight i mean he is he is one of the most esteemed and one of, one of the uh most respected individuals out there specific i mean for good reason this man is incredibly stubborn to a fault and 
I think uh, that has caused him to lose out on a lot of opportunities uh, throughout his career. He got blacklisted, but I think he never strayed away from, you know, his, his emancipatory work overall. And I really, really respect him for that. And then on the other hand, you have like a, a dude who streams online myself included, but a dude who streams online, who's like a mercenary who only learns about issues as he, as it's happening. And then, uh, you know, plays catch up to try to cultivate the best possible argument. Now, if you're on the right side of uh, issues, maybe that can work, but doing it on the, on the side of genocide is definitely not easy work, I guess. It's nasty work, man. I watch, <laughs> watching him, it, 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 it sort of speaks to what media culture is right now. You get a guy like a Benny Morris, who I don't agree with on lots of things, right? But Benny Morris is one of the most uh, brilliant, certainly one of the most decorated uh, historians in, in, in Israel's history. Um, you get Finkelstein. You get Moin uh, uh, Rabani, right? Well-known in diplomatic and intellectual circles. You get three giants. And then you get Destiny, who, again, he and I got along. I've spoken to him since then, so I don't want to seem like I'm talking shit behind his back. I, I like, I, I don't, I don't dislike him, right? But there's just no reason why he should be in that conversation. You know, I agree. Um, do you do you worry, as somebody who's in the streaming space and as a media commentator, that, that that social media has taken people who don't belong in the room and put them there, and and that the audiences can't tell the difference? Because that's the concern a lot of people have. Absolutely, I think that happens all the time. But I do think that it always happened in media. Social media has, like, I guess in some respects, democratized it. Because, like, I don't think Ben Shapiro deserves to be in rooms like that, but he certainly always is. So, uh, in a way, I guess, like, you know, anyone can be that asshole now, which is great, I guess. Uh, God knows what it does to um, to discourse in general. But, like, a lot of people asked me at the time, like, oh, wouldn't you do this conversation? Wouldn't you be a part of a conversation like this? And I very openly stated that like, although I am definitely more knowledgeable than, than uh, Mr. Bone or Shelley on, uh, on the Palestinian plight, Israel, Palestine history in general, because I didn't just like play catch up after October seven and land on the genocide side before I learned who the prime minister was, or, uh, you know, make really silly mistakes like that. Even then, I know that I, uh, I I know that I don't belong in that room because I don't want to embarrass myself like that as well. It's like it's an act of self-preservation, even. But ultimately, I think we have a reward mechanism in media that certainly exists in social media as well, where it doesn't really matter if you make a fool of yourself because people still tune in, people still pay attention. So I guess like it might uh, it might benefit you. Who knows? How'd you get here? How, how did you get to a place where you were? having millions of subscribers and followers and viewers and, and people look to you for answers of, for th about things. How, how'd you get to this space? Um, I've talked about this quite a bit recently, actually. I think it was because like a lot of the things that I believed in, the things that I advocated for very publicly, even back when I was at the Young Turks, um, basically people started playing catch up. I think BLM was a big turning point. Um, you might remember this. Many people don't know this at all, and it's been retconned at this point. But like Black Lives Matter wasn't favored by liberals at all. Black Lives Matter in its inception, especially when it was more radical than it than it the more commoditized version of like the org, I guess, or even as like a like a cultural phenomenon uh, where, you know, you had Walmart throwing up like a Black Fist logo while simultaneously, you know, funding police forces all around the country. Um, before all of that, Black Lives Matter started under Obama, uh, like as a, as a movement, I guess, obviously, you know, black liberation didn't start under Obama, but, and at the time I remember distinctly advocating for this and getting a lot of flack from liberals in general, because they felt like in a way that is not dissimilar to how many liberals who advocate for Joe Biden, getting mad at people talking about Gaza all the time. They were very upset because it disrupted, uh, you know, Barack Obama's wonderful legacy. Like it was you're right. you're kind of like ruining the situation here. Like we have bigger problems to worry about, like Barack Obama or, or, or Black Lives Matter and police brutality under Barack Obama is not that big of a problem. Oh, it'll be much worse under a Republican administration. And I think the point I was trying to make is in the most convoluted way possible. I was already there. And then it became fashionable for a lot of people to also be on board with it after George Floyd. 
Uh, especially, I think I remember the turning point. I remember when the Pod Johns, like Tommy Vitor and uh, John Favreau, and they all openly apologized for being critical of BLM. It was after Colin Kaepernick was in the crosshairs of Donald Trump. Once Donald Trump was like, oh, fuck this BLM stuff, then liberals negatively polarized against Donald, who are always primed to be negatively polarized against Donald Trump, decided, oh, maybe it's a good thing, actually. So in that moment, a lot of liberals were were way more radical with emancipatory politics. And I think that's when uh, when people were like, oh, well, this guy's been saying this for years. Maybe he knows what he's talking about. Let's pay attention to him. Well, another issue that you you managed to do that for is is Israel. Uh, you, as you pointed out earlier, you've been talking about this for a long time. You didn't come on board. Uh, on so have our, you. And yeah, and and yeah. we we caught a lot of hell for it. <laughs> we caught a lot of hell for yeah. it. Um, but now I think we're getting some of that back in the sense that people are saying, "Well, shit, they've been saying this for for years. Maybe we should start listening to them." Yeah, or Norm. Actually, I mean, it it, it between yeah. us three, I would say like I did not have uh, a lot of consequences because I was always in independent independent media. Uh, Norm was, you know, blacklisted from academia for, I mean, due to his uh, personal squabbles with Alan Dershowitz, you yeah. got, uh, you, you were, you were taken off air on uh, CNN, if I recall, right. For, and almost fired from Temple university. Yeah. For, uh, for delivering a speech at the UN. That's right. Where you ended the speech with from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Yes. The, yeah, the, the craziest thing. I, actually, let me get your opinion on something, right? Because there's actually a story uh, that came out today that I want to get your opinion on. I, I'll, I'll let my audience know. Um, the House condemns from the river to the sea as anti-Semitic. In a 377 to 44 vote, the House of Representatives passed a resolution to condemn the pro-Palestinian chant from the river to the sea. Uh, they deemed it as anti-Semitic. Now, among those to vote against it were Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib, uh, AOC, Jamal Bowman, Cory Bush, and uh, Pramila Jayapal. But this is scary business. 44 people vote against it, but 377 people say River to the Sea is anti-Semitic. Help me understand why someone would make that choice. I think uh, they're desperately flailing. Like they're just trying to swing at anything and trying to like uh, reaffirm their commitment in some meaningful way uh, to to the cause of defending Israel. And they're just kind of hitting the same notes over and over again. The very same issue with defending Israel exists on all fronts as it does in Congress as well. That's precisely the reason why old Hasbro tactics are no longer you like usable in this circumstance and yeah. i don't think that regardless of this decision that congress made which i do think is very ironic especially after they censured rashida talib and um you know no such censure was offered to tom cotton a senator who uh <laughs> yesterday around the same time when this bill was being passed was talking about how you should kill protesters who are blocking traffic for uh for for bringing awareness to the ongoing genocide in gaza Right. Um, you know, you, you, there's just, I mean, it's silly. It's nonsense. I think ultimately the people do recognize it. I put this, especially now in the same category as like Democrats being like, Oh, people are using chewing tobacco or Zin. We should ban that. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, they just don't, they don't have anything else going on. So they got to act like right. they're doing something. Yeah. You know, and it, it serves to box the 44 people who vote no into a certain kind of corner because it looks like they're pro, you know, anti-Semitism. It's like when they when they created that that weird bill uh, to ban Hamas from coming here like a month or two ago. Or, or it was like <laughs> this bill makes no sense. It's already illegal. This 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 has no legal teeth to it. It's just a performance. And then but they make it look like anybody who doesn't vote for it is suddenly is trying to get Hamas to like fly in on JetBlue. And it's like, that's not what this is about. It's all performance. I, the question, though, I have for you is, does the calculus change now, knowing that this doesn't work in the same way? In other words, Biden, for example, is doubling down, right? He's like, we're still standing next to Israel. We're still doing this. We're still doing this. Here's 14 billion more, please. He's offering. 
um, is he, does he pay the price for that in November? And if he does, does that forever change the kind of political calculus for Democrats or for any politician? Because up to now, it's been side with Israel, go down swinging with Israel. It, it's always your best chance politically. Um, the the more cynical side of me thinks that they will stay the course unconditionally because Israel does suit the needs of the American uh, the American foreign policy interests in the region. However, I do think that the way we approach the Israel conversation is uh, altered dramatically. I think that it will no longer be, as we have seen, uh, the same for the Democratic Party. I don't think that the Democratic Party in future generations, future iterations of it, will offer the same unconditional support that Joe Biden offered to Israel, especially for two reasons. One, obviously, because the constituencies are demanding action in the exact opposite direction that Biden is taking the conversation to. But beyond that, I do think that there has been something that I noticed from uh, the jump since October 8, uh, where there have been calls for restraint from the State Department. So I think there's internal conflict, it's maybe two different camps, possibly even more. But in the most reductive terms, I think there's two different camps within the State Department right now where the more realistic State Department actors, not out of care or consideration for Palestinian safety, mind you, but simply for the interest of the continuation of Israel, basically, even as an apartheid state, as a matter of fact, understand that leaving Israel unrestrained was going to inevitably cause too much destabilization. Now, obviously, up, up to a certain point, that kind of destabilization is great for Raytheon stocks. But once you get to a tipping point, all of a sudden, nobody's making money. And I think that they recognize that. I think that they recognize that like Israel striking the, the uh, consulate compound in Damascus is a, a massive error from the perspective of someone who is genuinely interested in maintaining the stranglehold that it has over the Middle East. If I'm America... I'm looking at that and I'm going, what the fuck are you guys doing? We right. have to do something about this. They're, they are going to bring about World War III. They're going to bring about like some kind of nuclear panic here. Um, so does the yeah. U.S., does, do Democrats, from that same cynical logic, do they do themselves a disservice by not just saying, hey, Israel, they, they, they got this one wrong? Yeah, I think so. I think that uh, there isn't, like a lot of the... A lot of the boundaries are on political lines at this point. I think that obviously the Republicans unconditionally have a lot of skin in the game for both the religious justifications that psychopathic evangelical Protestant churches make, you know, the Armageddon theological justifications that are very important for a significant number of people that also do have outsized political influence in this country, as we saw with the abortion uh, situation. Um, so that's not going to go away. I think that those Republican Party owns that constituency. So they will always be unconditionally and full blown uh, supportive of Israel, no matter how genocidal they may get. But I do think that the Democratic Party needs to uh, move away from it and, and back themselves into a more comfortable liberal Zionist narrative. Uh, uh, definitely very different than the way Joe Biden has been handling. It. By no means are they going to be anti Zionist tomorrow. It's not what I'm saying at all. But I do think that. They're going to try to retriangulate, uh, especially post Biden, in the way that they have Kamala Harris talking to Benny Gantz as though he's any better than Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> yeah, uh, Benny Gantz, who famously ran on uh, his war crimes when he was going up against Benjamin Netanyahu, he was like, "No, no, no, I'm a war criminal too. Like, shit's awesome." Um, that guy is the reasonable voice in the room, right? And. Uh, I think that they will try to manipulate Israeli domestic policy to some degree, like the Democratic Party will. They'll try to they'll try to have the more reasonable approach, but um, ultimately, I think that uh, it will never look the same as it did before. I think I think that's right. Does that calc does that any of that change depending on whether Democrat or Republican gets into office? I mean, we have a sense um, of what Trump will do. I mean, he he was Netanyahu's, you know, uh, you know better half but um, buddy yeah exactly, exactly. i was trying to find a, a, a it is funny i mean they're both super right wing they obviously have an even further more scary right wing out there but they're like the most politically appealing right wing figure they're both super corrupt in incredibly incompetent ways and they're both trying to avoid uh criminal prosecution 
it's wild. So so it, it seems to me I, I'm I'm not convinced that Democrats or Republicans are going to give us a, a dramatically different outcome. You know, no. if, if Joe Biden is the gentle one, if he's if he's the one who's the the least hawkish of the two, and this is the best we get is him doing press leaks pretending to be mad at Netanyahu or you know leaking that he's calling Netanyahu a dick. <laughs> you know, while while still sending him fourteen billion dollars, and I, I don't know if I feel any better about this. Yeah, no, it's the situation is dire, but also I guess it's always dark as before dawn, right? Uh, I do feel like there is genuinely a lot of attitudes changing in the American public consciousness that has uh, truly made people who were very comfortable with the way that uh, uh, information dissemination worked in the past when it was much more limited and mostly through, uh, you know, the correct channels in mainstream media. Uh, it, it, it's truly changed the way people perceive the situation. I mean, you see the demographic breakdown. You see that anyone under the age of 35 has wildly different opinions on Israel and, and Palestinians um, than, than anyone over the age of 35. And I think that that is not going to go away no matter how much like, uh, what's his name, Jonathan Greenblatt of the ADL uh, chirps about TikTok making children into Hamas supporters. So what, what does a reasonable solution look like? I talked to someone uh, who's a uh, State Department veteran and they're, they're still believing sincerely from what i could see and they're often full of shit but i i, I could he seems sincerely to believe um that a two-state solution was still the only way to go he wasn't optimistic about a two-state solution but he thought that a two-state solution was the only actual viable option he said when you get past the, t the, the posturing and the talking points and all that stuff a one-state solution ain't happening so you're gonna have to figure out something and of course right now in, in the un uh this week there's a conversation and a vote that's going to take place about recognizing Palestinian as Palestine as a state. And with member status, that also increases maybe at least the optimism around a, a diplomatic solution to all of this. So when you, when you think about that and you hear all the, the developments, do you see a legitimate chance of a two state solution? And if not, what is what is the way this thing ends? I mean, I think currently it's a one state. I think that it already is a one state. And that the only solution is the abolition of the apartheid. That's the way I look at it. I think the idea that this is like uh, the two state solution is ever going to look anything different than uh, the, the way that the so-called peace process has ever looked is, is silly. Um, that's precisely the reason why a lot of scholars that I trust, uh, especially as it pertains to Israeli history, like Avi Shlaim and, and Elon Pape and many others have changed their attitude from uh, it being ardent supporters of a two-state solution to a single state, a single solitary secular state, because of, because of the the as a matter of fact, ironically, because Excellent. of the peace process, because of the settlements that were the real reason for why the peace process continued. It was just a way to pass the buck down as the Israeli state openly at first turning a blind eye to the settlements and then openly and actively encouraging settlements and building them themselves and protecting them and now doing pogroms at the behest of or defending those who are doing pogroms uh, in the in the West Bank. So I, I don't think that there is any other realistic scenario out of it. Now, how to get to that one state, I guess like uh, it starts off with uh, a, a commitment to Palestinian statehood, no matter what it looks like. Uh, I think I believe the term is what is it binational? Yeah, uh, where, where it's like two states under the same banner, right. something along those lines. Um, with obviously international guidance, uh, severely restricting what the Israeli state, the power players in the region, can and can't do. Um, but um, that's that's my assessment of the situation. It's the most realistic scenario because a two-state solution, especially 1967 boundaries, uh, requires the forcible expulsion of 750,000 Jewish settlers in the West Bank. Almost 100,000 of said Jewish settlers in the West Bank are actually American citizens, as a matter of fact. So the idea that we would uh, we would rip 750,000 settlers from the West Bank, I think is a laughable one. I think that the reason, especially because they're the biggest freaks uh, of all time, they are 
they believe in in uh, this this religious cause that they're participating in. It's not like they're looking at it like it's free real estate and all right. of a sudden they're going to give up. I mean, we saw how the settlers operated in the Gaza Strip. There were only 8,000 of them at the time, but they had to be forcibly removed they, yeah, by the yeah. IDF. Right. So it, it would look very, I mean, that would be a, a, a dangerous prospect. And as much as some people might want to see uh, some kind of vengeance, I don't think that that's how justice works. The only way for a truly just process to occur would be to offer uh, reparations, not to the Israeli settlers, of course. I mean, reparations to the Palestinians. It is what we did during, obviously, during slavery. But uh, so it's just important to clarify, I guess. But right. reparations to the Palestinians and then uh, offering them full-blown citizenship and and working through, I guess, a successful reconstruction uh, rather than the unsuccessful one that we had here in the United States of America. Do you see that in your lifetime? Do you think any of that happens in your lifetime? I mean, there are there are decades where nothing happens, and then there are weeks where decades happen, right? And I never thought that in my lifetime, if you were to tell me five, six, seven years ago, like right before the turning point when a lot of these NGOs openly declared Israel to be an apartheid regime in 2021 which then gave a lot more moral permission to those who were afraid of, of speaking the truth about Israel's existence as an apartheid regime. Um, before then, if you were to ask me, like, do you think people will openly say Israel's an apartheid? That, you know, massive numbers within the American population, within the Western world, hundreds of thousands of people would be on the streets protesting the, the uh, Israeli apartheid and the Israeli genocide against Palestinians. I would look at you like you got three eyeballs and and that has happened in a relatively short period of time now obviously it came with a cost it, we're talking tens of thousands of palestinians men women children murdered by the israeli regime however um people are waking up to that reality i'm glad I'm you sure. said the cost um because and i, and I know you got to run soon i just want to ask you a couple more questions the oh, that's okay the, the um the cost a lot of people say forget about for a minute international law forget a minute forget for a minute about any kind of ethical questions right just for a second when we think about what hamas does on october 7th was it strategically wise if you know the they breach the border 1139 israelis are killed dozens kidnapped and the result is mass hunger, mass famine, the killing of probably over 40,000 people, if you count the people under the rubble, um, wounded over 77,000 at this point, uh, and maybe the permanent loss of, of any kind of gov governance inside of the Strip, um, and, and maybe the expulsion of, of, of people, depending on what happens you know, after the Rafah invasion. Um, in light of all of that, did Hamas make the right move? Um. I can't say only time will tell. Obviously, um, obviously it's a, it's an act of desperation. Their goal, um, as stated by themselves openly is to, uh, make the, uh, Zionist regime, uh, understand that the apartheid cannot continue without cost. This is what they, this is what they do as the only form of militant resistance in the region with the exception of, I guess, like uh, a more ascetic, uh, DFLP, PFLP. And, and of course, uh, the other actor, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, they have um, the reason why they send rockets over the Gaza fence into Israel proper is not because they're like, oh, yeah, I love anti-Semitism. I love doing anti-Semitism. I can't wait to kill as many Jewish people as I possibly can. It's usually in response to the actions of the Israeli government. Do I think that October 7 uh, was was a tragedy? Absolutely. But uh, overall, do I think that it will be successful? I, I don't know. I, I think so far the dynamic has shifted. But like you said, the cost of the human casualty toll is, is so high that I don't know. I don't know if this is like, it's not up to me, I guess. It's not something yeah. that I can make an assessment on. I'm not Palestinian. I'm not living in Gaza. You know, my parents weren't murdered by Israeli Mark 84 rockets. So it's not like, I don't know what that, 
I don't know what that decision-making process looks like if I'm in those shoes, but I do know that it is one made out of desperation. It is one I, that Israel has taught the Palestinian population. It's one that Israeli's population is actually teaching the rest of the regional actors right now, that they only respond uh, to force. And what do I mean? Not respond as in like they will reply in kind, but if you show yourself to be an actor, a regional actor to be reckoned with, if you respond back in a, in a defensive posture and even uh, show your willingness to engage in violent means like Hezbollah did and like Iran is doing now, that uh, Israel will reason with you to a certain degree in comparison to how unreasonable they are when you are seemingly defenseless like the Palestinian population. They're so good at slaughtering children. They are so good. That's like, that's the wheelhouse, right? <laughs> but they do they do have to reconsider. And the Israeli population, sorry for, you know, not shutting the fuck up here, but the Israeli population, oh, oh. Uh, the Israeli population public sentiment is something that I care about, something that I look into. Not that it matters in the grand scheme of things, because if America said, no longer are you doing this, we're cutting you off, then Israel would have to respond and say, okay, you're, you're right, my bad, we're dialing it back. However, when you look at the Israeli public sentiment, New polls came out of Hebrew University this past weekend after the Iranian uh, retaliation for the for the consulate bombing. And I believe an insane number, like 76% of Israelis said that they did not want Israel to retaliate if it harmed our relationship with our allies. And 52% said that they don't want to go to war with Iran in general. So that number is very different when you ask the Israeli population about like their level of enthusiasm to continue the bombing campaign in Gaza, they do not see the Palestinian ethnic cleansing as a, a serious force that will, uh, that will be able to inevitably push back and fight back against them. So they're full throttle. Let's keep it going. But when it comes down to Iran, they're like, okay, well, maybe we need to be a little bit more restrained, especially when considering our allegiances here. Yeah, I I, I keep thinking about, and, and, and Norm said this, Norm Finkelstein said this to me too, um, and he made me think about it a little bit differently. He compared it to the Warsaw Ghetto uprisings. You know, I mean, if you're in a concentration camp and death is imminent and you resist, it's it's unimaginable to me that someone would look at that person and say resistance is futile why are you getting yourself killed why are you bringing on more pain why are you bringing on, you know you know we would celebrate their resistance it's what yeah. it means to be human you know and if we begin from the place and i think you and i both do that gaza is just a slow death you know it's like when we got when we freed mumia abu jamal from from death row we were happy, but at the same time, we were like, he's still on slow death row. He's, he's unlawful, you know, he, he's, 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 in, he's a life sentence for something he didn't do. That's just slow death row. And so Gaza is just a slow death inside of a concentration camp, as opposed to a death march, as opposed to a gas chamber. You know, some of the most prominent Israeli voices uh, have called it a concentration camp. It's what it is. And so if people inside of a concentration camp who are consigned to death slowly decide, hey, we're going to fight, like you said, so that people understand that this occupation is going to come at a cost. You know, I personally don't believe in killing civilians. I personally don't believe in kidnapping civilians. Or, or I agree. Yeah. yeah. That, that's my ethical orientation. But I, I'm also, like you said, I'm also not in a concentration camp. Yeah. People will never understand, especially those of us who are, you know, living in the imperial core where uh, one of our biggest issues is if like Applebee's no longer has jalapeno poppers, you know what I mean? Like we will never comprehend what it's like to live under those circumstances. So for us, we're like, why are they fighting back? I don't understand. Why don't they just like chill out and go to McDonald's? <laughs> right. But it doesn't work that way for people who have no hope. People in America never understand like suicide bombing, for example, they think it's like someone behaving in an extremely irrational way. Of course you think that because why the fuck would you blow yourself up? You live in America. You know what I mean? It's unimaginable, but that is an act of desperation. It's not something that people positively uh, uh, want to do. They're not like, Oh, I can't wait to strap myself 
with bombs and like explode myself in a fucking bus stop. Like no one is doing that unless they are backed into a corner. And because that is so outside of our scope of imagination, those living conditions is a constant torment. And, and also the fear that things will only get worse, the constant trauma, so much so that you can't even have post-traumatic stress disorder because the trauma never stops. Mm. That, that of course is going to dramatically change people, but because we are so far removed from that kind of existence that I think the counter narratives of like, well, these people are barbaric and they are, you know, they're Islamists and that's how Islam just is. Like Islamophobia is so successful uh, for this reason, because we have no way of contextualizing that kind of violence because that's so far removed from us. That's the only thing we see. The only, the only time we see that kind of violence is on television and it's, you know, brown children. And that happens in the other side of the world. That doesn't happen to us, which is why I've always thought, it's very important to also stress the apartheid's most evil but more personalized instances of violence in the form of the West Bank pogroms, especially when you're making an argument you, for America. For the audience, you know, can, can you talk about what the, the pogroms are in, in the West Bank for people that don't know? Yeah. So in the West Bank, settlers operate in the identical way that the Klan operates, where uh, a lot of the West Bank settlers personally create uh, basically paramilitary groups that uh, will go and mark certain houses of Palestinians in order to endlessly harass them and inevitably even sometimes kill them and burn their houses down, uh, burn their uh, olive trees down, burn their farmland down. And then um, when they end up doing that, their, their goal ultimately is to basically push the Palestinians that are living in these villages away so they can then turn around and build these, further build these illegal settlements on top of uh, what once was a Palestinian village. It is identical to the Klan in the way that the Klan operated during the Reconstruction uh, period. And they get complete backing from the IDF. And they are so out of control that they end up sometimes killing uh, Jewish people that are also living in the West Bank, where uh, they'll they'll think that uh, there was a case recently, like a couple months ago, uh, post October seven, mind you, and they've been re- very busy. It's been one of the deadliest years in the West Bank for Palestinians since October seven because the settlers have been utilizing the chaos to further push away as many Palestinian villages as they possibly can. Where uh, I remember there was a there was a stabbing attack. These are uh, very frequent in the West Bank. You have like teenagers or women, and the elderly, uh, sometimes taking matters into their own hands. Because of course, why wouldn't they do that? Obviously, they are under military occupation. It is literally moral and just, and also in many instances permissible under international law to resist against a military occupation. Um, so. When they do stuff like that, of course, the IDF shoots them or kills them. But sometimes the IDF can't get there fast enough. So other Israelis will take matters in their own hands. I remember there was a a, a ex-police officer that was in the West Bank of the day. They shot and killed uh, this this kid who they said had a knife or something. And then a settler wearing IDF fatigues, not a part of the IDF, by the way. Many of the settlers are super religious and actually don't even serve under a uh, religious exemption, which is another point of contention domestically for Israeli society. But an, I, a settler wearing military fatigues walked up to that police officer and shot and killed him. There are instances of this happening all the time. And at first, they didn't do anything. They, they didn't even prosecute him until uh, there was public outcry uh, demanding some kind of justice. And then the IDF grabbed them and uh, you know criminally prosecuted him, I believe. I don't know what his punishment is going to look like. I haven't really kept up with it. And I might've actually butchered the, uh, the exact details. It was somewhere along those lines. And this kind of thing happens often because once again, just like with the overarching attitude that Israel has in the region as the major destabilizing force, if you don't restrain your attack dog, inevitably they are going to come back and bite you as well. And that's the case that's, uh, you know, I guess happening as a microcosm within the West Bank with respect to the to the way that the settlers operate there as well. Wait, I can't hear you. 
Can you hear me? So I hit the wrong button. Oh. Uh, talk talk to me about Trump. Um, you you have followed him and been one of the close. Uh, one of the great things I love on your program, uh, when I watch you on your platform, is your your criticisms of Trump, your analysis of Trump. What do you make of where he is now? I mean, I think he's he's very short sighted and very self interested. So I think like. If we're thinking about what Trump is doing right now, I think he's just trying to, in the simplest terms, avoid criminal scrutiny and criminal prosecution. And he's definitely narcissistic enough and selfish enough to use the entire Republican Party as his uh, wet rag to to get whatever he needs to do done. Um, I mean, he's using the Republican Party's coffers, obviously, to pay for his legal fees, which is hilarious in and of itself. And the Republican Party certainly deserves it, by the way. Um, but um, I think that's his major motivation in this instance. I don't I never was a believer that he was a firm and committed ideological fascist. His actions certainly are. His actions are very proto fascist. And he's obviously like he doesn't care if fascism all of a sudden took over. Like, I don't think he would care. He wouldn't be like, Oh no, this is too, it's a bridge too far. He does have that level of privilege that uh, allows him to behave in that way as a billionaire and as a, you know, white dude. Um, however, I think it requires more reading to be a committed fascist. And he's not going to do that. Like he, he didn't, he doesn't give a shit about like, doing the racism reading <laughs> he didn't major fascism too many prereqs <laughs> yeah he didn't he's not gonna like he's not gonna sit around and read like culture of critique or any number of different things that these fucking losers talk about like the ann coulters of the world you know what is it um there's like a couple like the turner diary style stuff that people always talk about like trump is not doing that that's why i always laugh when people are like oh he has a copy of mein Kampf on his like bed uh on his nightstand i was like that motherfucker didn't read that. Get out of here. <laughs> like, he might break up Adderall pills or lines of coke on it, but he's absolutely yeah. not open it. He, that, he probably thought it was Riz. <laughs> he was <laughs> like, yeah, look, see, I love this book. He's a dangerous guy. You know? <laughs> might be Riz in his world. So, so uh, Does he win this election? Um, It depends. I, I, I think that the Republican Party, weirdly enough, is doing everything they can. It's like the inverse of the Democratic Party in some ways. Uh, to lose the election. The abortion stuff is a major issue, like an unimaginable issue for them. They are losing the suburbs. Uh, white women, uh, which was a constituency that went to by 52% to Donald Trump in 2016 against Hillary Clinton, uh, it, uh, definitely uh, are not, white women are not too fond of the whole abortion decision. And the thing, the problem there is that Republicans are usually very good at like advocating for horrible policy and never fully following through on it. Um, and only incrementally making things worse. Usually like trap laws, for example, basically, uh, fun uh, functionally made it so that it was, uh, almost impossible to get an abortion. You didn't have to criminalize abortion to do to, to, to get the job done. So now that they actually are responsible, now that the dog caught the car on the issue of abortion, um, they own it. And there's no other way around it. People see that. People recognize that. And and that's why they're in this like weird uh, messaging conundrum where they're like, oh, well, I do we want a federal abortion ban? Like some people are still trying to push the um, push the the. Some people are still trying to tr stress test this, uh, this, this issue, and and take it to the next step. And at least Trump is like a a, a permanent room reader who recognizes that and that's not a good idea. So he's saying like, no, 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 you don't understand. I made it into states' rights, which everybody wanted. And he's just like lying and saying like everyone demanded that we uh, overturn Roe v. Wade. Right. So they're in this delusional situation, and I think that's a major issue. Um, another issue is depending on what happens with foreign policy and what and what the global uh, uh, economic implications of of our foreign policy actions will look like come the election. Uh, you might have a very different attitude, like the American population might have a very different attitude about Joe Biden's economy. Um, so it's dependent on those factors and dependent on the uh, depending on how much people think that Trump's corruption and and fascism will genuinely harm their bottom line and harm their uh, uh, 
harm the way that they exist in this country. On the other hand, Democrats, of course, on the Democratic Party, they're permanent losers. They always are trying to desperately lose. They're just trying to be like one step below, uh, never as bad as the Republicans, but like just not as bad. You know what I mean? One step less worse than the Republican Party, which is not a great position to be in. Joe Biden's foreign policy is is really ineffective. It makes him look weak. The like it makes him look so weak that people drop the you know sleepy Joe attitude almost because they think that his his actions or rather lack thereof and the indecisive nature in which he presents himself. Where on the one hand he's leaking to the press that he's saying really mean things about Netanyahu, while on the other hand trying to send him billions of dollars worth of weapons as as fast as possible. Does this Iran the, change that at all? Does he look tougher now when he says, look, we're not going to engage in any military reaction with Israel. We're not putting boots on the ground. No. We're not fighting Iran. Not yet. No shot. No, I don't. That that would require people to like pay that much attention. And the fact that it got to this point implies that people genuinely don't pay attention to begin with. Um, but people do... Uh, because they're not as tapped in, people do pay attention to the 30,000 dead or more importantly than that. And I hate to say it in such words, the seven aid workers that were killed, six of them were white. That was a major blow to the Israeli reputation in the Western world. Like that caused irreparable harm. You're muted again. This is why you're a streaming expert. Dead white people are always bad for business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point, though. That's why these aid organizations uh, exist to begin with. That's what that is the stated goal of Doctors Without Borders is like and and many activists that work in NGOs such as that will openly tell you that like they are white bodies in places of conflict because that has a much larger political uh, consequence for those who end up, you know, killing them. Barack Obama never apologized for any of the bombings except for the hospital in Kunduz. Why did he apologize for the Kunduz hospital bombing? Because, as you know, there were Italian and French doctors there, right. white doctors, and he killed them. And that was a big oopsie. You can't kill white people. It's like rule number one. Yeah. And definitely not right, white women. And, oh, yeah. And and, and, and so it, it, it makes for an interesting thing. Anyway, man, I just, I'm so grateful that you stopped in, man. I'm, 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 of course. I'm, I'm I'm so excited um, to talk to you. Um, we got to do this again sometime, man. I I feel like everybody knows where to find you, but for those that don't, what's the best way to hear your brilliance every day? I'm live every day at twitch.tv slash Hassanavi, and uh, you know my Instagram and TikTok is Hassan D Piker. I post there as well. Um, and yeah, that's where you can find me. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you, bro. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Everybody, y'all know the man, the myth, the legend, man. That was Hasanavi. He is super dope, super brilliant. Um, such a cool dude, man. Uh, I'm grateful that he came out to hang out with us, but I'm also grateful for his insight, man. There just aren't a lot of prominent, thoughtful, interesting left-wing voices uh, out there. Most of them are uh, capitulating. Most of them are trying to get MSNBC contracts. Most of them are trying to get fit, fit, famous and rich, and they'll say and do whatever it takes to get there, but Hasanabi's not that, man. He he is, he's courageous, and he's articulate, and he's smart, and, you know, there are, um, there are a lot of people out there um, who use their platforms um, only to advance their own agenda, but they don't actually talk about the issues of the day, and the fact that he does, man, I just think that's so dope. We are building uh, production space. We are building studio space. We are editing more footage. We are hiring more producers. We do all of it with what you donate. So we're building and we're growing as independent media. We want to continue to do independent media. We, I don't want to be tied to a big company. I don't want to be tied. Not in this space. I do corporate media sometimes, yes. I work for international national media. Absolutely, I'm not denying that. And I'm not running from it. I'm going to continue to do what I do in Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera and Grio and BET and all the other places. But what we do here again is not a it's it's different. And thank you, Chef Shia. Kimberly Holmes, thank you. What we're doing here is political education. What we're doing here is a, creating a global classroom. That's the work that we're doing here. And we need your support. So I appreciate you all for watching. If you don't know, I also do a podcast with Mumia Abu Jamal called The Classroom and the Cell. It's right here on the channel, Marco My Hill. 
official YouTube channel. We're right here doing it a couple times a week. So check that out. I got the Coffee and Books podcast up here. So if you want to check out the, the podcast about authors, come on through. Whatever it is, come through, show your love, and we'll be here with you. But I'll talk to y'all soon. Appreciate y'all. Peace.